Live. What do you know about that? So um, we're gonna wait for my sister Nancy to get on. She actually was early today. She was all ready to go at two o'clock and then realized it wasn't the correct time. <laughs> so today we're gonna be doing salt and boca, and we're doing a not traditional presentation. So I have never in my life made this presentation before. Um, I have made the traditional presentation before, but I've never made this one. And I'm gonna tell you why I love it so much. Several years ago, I was invited to a restaurant opening and I took my friend Lynn with me and they brought out this salt and mocha that was on the bone. It was a veal chop that was still on the bone. They had butterflied it, they pounded it super thin and they filled the butterfly amount, you know, the butterfly meat with the cheese and the mozzarella, which was amazing. And then they fried it. And so it was like this stuffed veal chop that was amazing. We're gonna recreate it with chicken. I've never done it, so it's gonna be a learning experience for all of us. Um, but I wanted to take a couple of minutes to thank all of you who have been following along the whole time. I appreciate you spending part of your Saturday with me. Now that quarantine is partially lifted and I don't really need to help you cook because you can actually go out to eat now, we're gonna move this to once a month because everybody that I asked said, yes, please keep cooking for me because I learned from you. And I'm like, okay, great. I'm super happy that you're learning something. Um, I never claim to be an expert in anything. I just, my mom calls me a know a lot of. I know a little bit about a lot of stuff. I'm not necessarily a know it all when it comes to cooking, but I'm a know a lot of, and I'm happy to share that uh, knowledge with you. So before we get started, I want to talk about a couple of different things. First of all, Nancy had difficulty finding polenta. And polenta is nothing more than coarsely ground corn. Now, the, the John, I'm going to ask you to really get close in on this so that everybody can see. Okay, so this is the cornmeal that you make cornbread out of. It's very fine. It leaves like a dust on your hands when you touch it. These are grit. This is white corn. And you'll notice it's the exact same texture as polenta. Okay, they're both coarsely ground. You can feel the difference between these. Um, and this one is an heirloom. Where, 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 where do you want me to go? I won't forget it. Okay. And this one is like an heirloom corn that is not just yellow or white, but it's a couple of different colors together. And it's also coarsely ground. This is actually what I'm going to be using today. So if all you have is this cornmeal that you make cornbread with, you aren't going to make polenta. You're going to end up making cornmeal mush, which isn't horrible, but it's not delicious. Okay. This is going to have a lot more texture. It's going to have a really great mouthfeel and it takes a while to cook because each of those individual little kernels and granules needs to suck up the water so that it can puff up and really fulfill its total flavor. So that being said, what I'm going to tell you right now is years ago, uh, my girlfriends from Texas came to visit me for the very first time here in Vegas. And I took them out to a buffet because the very first time you come to Vegas, you absolutely positively have to go to a buffet, period. End of conversation. Only right now, you can't do that. But I took them to the Bellagio buffet. Nanette and I were walking through and she goes, what's polenta? I said, it's Italian grits. She says, great. She was so happy. So if you are Southern, I know that you know how to make grits. If you are from any other part of the world and you know how to make grits, congratulations. You know how to make polenta. Okay? And that's all there is to it. It's super, super, super easy. It's a matter of water and time. That's it. Okay? So I'm going to put and these behind me. And today's episode of Quarantine Kitchen is brought to you by Noda Brown. <laughs> Actually, they've all been brought to you they've by Noda Brown. They've all been brought to you right now. 
So it is Father's Day weekend, and I'm kind of glad that when I asked you guys what you wanted to make, that this ended up getting the fewest amount of votes because it's one of my husband's favorite dishes. It's also one of my favorite dishes, and he gets to eat it on Father's Day weekend. So I'm super excited about that. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make our garnish, and then actually we're going to butterfly our breasts first, and then the first thing we're going to cook is gonna be our garnish because we are going to fry some of those sage leaves. So my chicken breasts are still in the fridge, which I have to get, sorry. I don't like to leave chicken out because as I have mentioned before, it is a germ factory. It is, you know, it's, you know, you have to treat raw chicken like it's radioactive according to my uh, first culinary school teacher, she said chicken is like the dirtiest thing there is. So I'm going to lay out Saran on my cutting board. And then we're going to move on to our butterfly. So if you watched the um, chicken piccata demonstration, and recipe, you already know how to butterfly your breasts. Congratulations, you're amazing. So, breast number one, you're gonna take it and put it pretty side up, okay? And then you're going to put your hand flat on top and you're gonna cut through the smooth side. So there's the part that actually connects to the breastbone and this is the part that goes on the outside. You wanna cut through that and you're going to go horizontal, about in the middle. And you don't want to cut all the way through. Okay? And I'm going to turn it this way so you can see what I'm doing. So if this is your first time joining us, you can see how you're going to almost cut all the way through. And you're going to lay it out so it looks a little bit like a butterfly almost like a heart, okay? Then you're gonna put it cut side down, put another piece of saran on the top. You'll notice I'm keeping my contaminated hand away from my saran wrap. And then we're gonna get our meat mallet. And as my son told you in the chicken piccata demo, you're going to push down and out. And you want to get this fairly thin. And if you need to, turn your meat around. Now the reason you want to use the saran is twofold. One, it's going to stop you from getting bacteria on your meat mallet. And two, it's going to stop you from having you know, chicken bits chicken flying bits everywhere. Flying everywhere, which, as I've already said, are radioactive. <laughs> and you just kind of want to get this fairly thin. And we're going to set it aside and we're gonna move on to our next one. And we're gonna do the exact same thing with our second chicken breast. What's kind of cool too is that if you have your chicken breast and it comes apart and makes a couple of pieces, if you stick them kind of close together and overlap them a little bit when you pound them, they'll stick together, they'll stick together. so it's like, Inert chicken glue. <laughs> or innate, innate chicken, chicken glue. glue. And again, watch your hands. Now, one of my friends, Gail, said she was lucky enough to get some beautiful uh, veal scallopini. V Gail, you don't need to be doing any of this. Because yours is already thin. And I'm sure it is beautiful. Gail actually um, and her husband, we met them on our Egypt cruise and they take best food pictures and they actually share them with me. So if you are taking pictures of your food, 
that I teach you how to make. I hope that you take the time to uh, post it to goodforspooning.com. Um, I'm sorry, Good for Spooning on Facebook or within the event so other people or can Instagram. see how you did. Or you can post it to Instagram and tag me. Oh, see, mine came apart. I kept too close. It's yours. <laughs> And by the way, as a reminder to anybody, when you're posting, um, any comments that are made uh, are made by me because I'm the one sitting here in front of the computer and the camera. So. That's correct. So if you think I've gone too far, too fast for you, all you have to do is touch your screen if you're watching it on your phone or hit it with your cursor and pause it. And then you can restart it and join us when it's convenient. But don't do it with chicken fingers. Don't do it with chicken fingers. They don't end up contaminating your phone. It's all fun and games until someone contaminates their phone. That's right. Whoop. Okay. I'm just going to move this on top of this other chicken. I'm going to wash my hands so we can move on to creating our garnish. Everybody should be really good at washing their hands by now. <laughs> You're out, you're, of yeah, okay. you're out of the shop. Yeah, that's okay. You're out of the shop. You're not out of the shop. Well, you're not now. Okay. Well, I'll put me back in the shop. Okay. So. Put this back here. Okay. <clears throat> so, the first thing we have to do is create our garnish. And we're going to put our burner on... Um, stun. That you set your yeah, burner to stun. 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 We're gonna put it on medium high. Wait for your pan to come warm. And then we're gonna work with some of our sage. Okay, so sage is really easy to grow at home. This one actually happens to be from Desert Bloom Eco Farm here in Las Vegas. They sent them to me and they're beautiful. Uh, Gail sent me a picture of her bush that is like 45 years old and it's this big. Sage is really easy to grow in a pot. Uh, you, you, you know, if you use poultry seasoning, it's primarily sage. A lot of people, the only time they use sage is at um, Thanksgiving. But it's great with poultry. It's great with veal. Pork. It's fantastic with pork. And so your leaves are going to be beautiful like that. And we're actually going to fry this in oil to create our garnish. Now with the other leaves, I told you to have five or six, we're going to really quickly give these a fine chop. This is one of the few recipes I make that has no garlic in it. Go figure. Now sage is a classic ingredient in salsa boba and the picture that I posted in the event is a classic presentation. So what I've done here is I made a stack of my sage leaves and I'm rolling them up into a cigar and then I'm going to cut across and yes I know I didn't wash this knife but that's okay because this sage is going to end up getting cooked so it's fine it's not going to be a raw garnish and that's called a chiffonade and now we're going to bring it into a little ball and we're going to run across So our sage is already ready to go. Now, if you are working with dried sage, obviously you're not gonna do this uh, garnish portion, but you are gonna need it for your breadcrumbs, so just be happy that you have it. Okay, my pan is warm. We're just gonna put in a couple of tablespoons of olive oil, not a whole lot. We're going to wait for it to shimmer. And then we're going to drop our sage leaves into the oil. Now, don't walk away. Because this happens fast. Okay? And it doesn't matter if you put it in furry side down or furry side up. Because either way, it's going to cook beautifully. 
flip it and you kind of want to push down with your slotted spoon or your spatula so it stays as flat as possible. And it doesn't take long. And if you're doing this right, your kitchen should be smelling amazing right now. Now you want to get this and keep flipping them as necessary until they're a beautiful dark green from the oil and the heat. It really doesn't take long. Okay, so this is what it's gonna look like when it's done. Beautiful dark green color. And I'm just gonna put it into a little dish on the side because it doesn't need to be hot as our garnish. It's gonna go on top of our dish when it's finished. Okay. And then you can shut your burner off if you're using um, a gas stove or if you're using electric, turn it way down. All right. So now we're gonna create our breading station. And breading station is always three. So you've got your flour. And we're doing a combination of breadcrumbs today. I like to use fine breadcrumbs. And panko together. Because I think it gives it a better texture than just either one alone. Because you've got a couple of different things going on. So let's talk about panko breadcrumbs. We're all pretty familiar with, you know, fine, plain breadcrumbs. And if you are throwing out your stale French bread, you're doing yourself a disservice. Throw it in the food processor or the blender, make your own breadcrumbs, stick them in a jar like I do, and they'll stay in the, in the uh, pantry for a while. Okay, so when you look at panko, panko is really coarse, and it's um, irregular shaped and kind of crunchy, and when it fries up, it's going to be super crunchy. So if you've gone to a, a sushi restaurant and you have ordered, um, you know, a tempura roll, it's either tempura bag or they coat the shrimp in these beautiful panko breadcrumbs. So those are your two options. And we're just going to mix them together. And this is going to be the last step in our breading thing. So now we're going to put our sage into our breadcrumbs. Okay. The chopped up sage is going into the breadcrumbs. And we're just mixing it with our hands. It doesn't have to be fancy. Into our flour, we're going to add a healthy pinch of salt. So I'm using all four fingers twice. And we're going to add some freshly ground black pepper. This isn't as easy to mix with your fingers, um, so I like to use a, a whisk. And then I'm gonna add dried sage to this. Now dried sage can come in a lot of different ways. If you've got rubbed sage, it's already perfect. Mine happens to be whole sage leaves, so I'm gonna rub it between my hands and break it up fine. And put it in there, and then we're gonna use this just to kind of combine everything. Now, traditional salt and boga, they actually marinate the chick chicken or veal or pork in uh, wine, white wine and sage for a couple of hours before they move on to this, before they move on to the cooking procedure. But we don't have time for that, okay? So this is how we're doing. All right, so now, where's my... Oh, here it is. God. It's, where you, it's where you left it. It's where I left it. So we're going to take our <laughs> eggs. And these are beautiful farm fresh eggs from a lady right here in Las Vegas. Her name is Margie. So when you crack an egg, I want to tell you something. If that yolk sits up really high like these ones are, and the white doesn't run too much, you've got a fresh egg. If your yolk flattens out and the white runs everywhere, those eggs are older. And it's not like that they're bad to eat, it's just 
they're not going to have the same texture as a really fresh egg. Which, in, for this use, it doesn't matter because we're mixing it. Why don't you just go off camera, Leanne? You do. You know, camera Why? Oh, remember I told you I wanted your eggs well beaten with a tablespoon of water. I just put my water into my egg. Thank you. Okay. So if you don't want any big clumps of white. You want it really well homogenized. And you can always tell when you tilt your tray if you see any bits of white. Like, it looks like a basically like an ice cream floating in your yolk. You need to mix some more. Okay, those ones are good. Now you're probably not going to use all of this flour, all this egg, and all these breadcrumbs. Um, I'm just going to tell you, you don't reuse them. You throw them out, okay? Unless you have a dog who likes egg, and then you can give it to the dog. We happen to have three. Okay, <clears throat> right. so we're going to get started with our polenta because polenta takes time. So get your burner started. Can you move your bottle of wine? I'm going to move my bottle of wine. You want to pour your four cups of water into your saucepan. And I'm actually using nonstick. I don't use nonstick for a lot of things, but for rice dishes, for polenta, for eggs, I have a tendency to really like to use a, um, a nonstick pan. And I gotta go off camera again, don't follow me. I forgot a measuring cup. Um, I thought I had everything ready, but of course I didn't. Okay, so we're gonna bring this to a boil and we're gonna put in again another healthy pinch of salt, four fingers twice, maybe three times. Because plain corn, I hate to break it to you, it's, you know, when it's browned up like this, it has no taste at all. It's really about what you're adding to it that's gonna make the difference in how everything comes together. Okay, I actually wanna move this behind me for the time being because we have to stuff our chicken breasts. Okay, so we're gonna start with the first one, the one that I pulled apart. Okay. Now I've got my prosciutto over here and my cheese is in the fridge because an important thing to remember about working with soft cheese is it shreds and slices better when it's cold. When you're working with hard cheeses like Parmesan, it actually grates better when it's at room temperature. So, uh, I kept this in the fridge till the very last minute. Another great tip for this is like, throw it in the freezer for 30 minutes. Uh, I'm gonna be working with a microplane, so I'm not really worried about um, how sharp my grater is, because it could be super sharp. So, set this off to the side. So you wanna take your chicken breast and you wanna make sure that the pretty side is down, okay? So we're gonna flip this over so that the part that's looking at you is the, both sides are cut, okay? So you want that pretty smooth outside to be face down onto the uh, cutting board. So, let's talk about prosciutto. Prosciutto is a salted and cured Italian ham. It is not smoked, okay? It's just salted and cured. Now, I sliced this up on my friend Samantha's slicer. You can get it pre-sliced in packages at the deli. You can get it sliced to order at the deli. This is rough cut because I did it. And we're going to put in a nice, if you're using, like I said, two pieces per breast, you wanna go ahead and do that, okay? 
You can go ahead and put three in mine. You, <laughs> well, this is the one I built, so this is mine. That's yours, yeah. Okay. So then we're going to take Just our... Help me plan ahead. Okay. Jumped right out of my hand. We're going to take our uh, mozzarella cheese, and we're going to grate it right onto that, okay? Now, I'm using a coarse microplane grater. You don't want to put too much in because what's gonna end up happening is it'll melt and it'll be in the pan instead of staying in the chicken or pork if you're using pork or veal if you're using veal. So you see, I've just got a nice light dusting. And now the way you grate cheese matters, okay? If you're using like chunks of cheese, it's not gonna melt evenly, okay? That's number one. Number two, the finer it is, the more equal the melting is going to be. So if you're using a coarse grated mozzarella, that's great, it tastes fine, it tastes the same. It's just not, not gonna melt the same way. That's just why I'm using kind of a finer grade. And then we're gonna take our other piece and put it over the top of our chicken and our, uh, our ham and our chicken. And we're just gonna slide it off to the side and we're gonna repeat with the other chicken breast. Again, put your pretty side down so that your cut side is up. And if your burner is like my burner, your uh, water should be just about ready to boil. Your water should be just about boiling. Just get quick, wash my hands again, because we all know that chicken is radioactive. And I have several kitchen towels, the ones that the chicken, that I wipe my chicken hands on, go on the floor for me to pick up later. Okay, so now we're gonna add in, while the water is boiling, get your whisk ready, and get your polenta ready. Now the key to this is stir, 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 and stir, and stir. Kind of like when we did the risotto, okay? You're gonna gently and slowly, notice how slow I'm pushing it in, and stir constantly while you're doing it. The reason you do this is so that you don't end up with any lumps. Have I got any questions yet, babe? I've been answering them as we go okay. along. Cheryl DiCarlo had a couple of questions. Hi, Cheryl, what were her questions? It had to do with the flour, what was the flour and the breadcrumbs mixed together, and also uh, had we added the polenta yet? No, we're doing it right now. Okay, so what's going to happen in your pan is it's going to foam up, just like mine is doing right now, stir, 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 stir and turn your burner down. Okay. And you want to get this on a relatively low heat. And you want to stir until it stops foaming. And mine has stopped foaming. My burner's now on low, okay? And we're going to cover it, right? We'll go back and stir it again later. All right, so again, we're gonna do our ham. Three slices. <laughs> I hate to break it too big, but they both fell apart. Doesn't matter. Okay. I want the hammier one. You want the hammier one. Because I do like my prosciutto. Okay, so if you have in the future, have difficulty finding prosciutto, you can substitute jamón de serrano, which is basically the Spanish version of prosciutto, or you can substitute speck, which is the smoked version of prosciutto. They're both salted and cured and aged. Speck is then smoked, prosciutto is not, okay? And I think the smoking actually comes before the aging. So yeah, Leanne's lucky. She has a husband that buys her a whole leg every year. I was just about year. to say that. 
So every year at Thanksgiving, my husband either buys me a leg of prosciutto or he buys me a leg of jamón de serrano. And we use it all year long. And as long as you vac seal it and keep it in the fridge, it's fine. Because it's already cured meat. Cured of what? We don't want to know. But if you keep it vac sealed, it won't have a relapse. Right. Okay, and again, put your cheese kind of even. You're going to pick up your other piece. And you're going to put it on the top and kind of just mash it down. So you've got this really nice chicken sandwich with ham and cheese on the inside. Does that make sense? All right. So we're going to put these off to the side a little bit. Now, if you had time to do this, you could do this part ahead of time, cover it and stick it in the refrigerator. And then when you're ready to cook, pull it out and do your breading process. So the breading station is always the same. It's a three-step breading process. And it is always flour first, then the egg, and then the breadcrumbs. That is the way it is. Don't ask me why. It's mainly because that's the way it's most effective to get the breading to stick to whatever it is that you're breading, okay? So now we're going to, again, put our pan on. We are going to put it on, again, medium heat. And I told you I have roughly six tablespoons of olive oil. Now we're gonna add the rest of it. So you already got in this pan some terrifically scented olive oil that has been basically seasoned with the sage, okay, which is phenomenal. So you're going to actually cook that into your chicken. All right, so here's my breading station. Let's give our polenta a quick stir. And then put the lid back on. All right. Now, one of the things I told you to have on hand was paper towels, and that's to drain this once it comes out of the oil. I'm actually going to do it on this instead because I try not to waste paper towels when I can avoid it. Okay. So here we go into the flour. And you want to shake it to get a good coating. And then flip it over. And if you pat everything down, your ham and your um, cheese will stay inside your chicken breast. And just give it a quick tap. And then into the egg. You kind of want to move it around a little bit so that you want to make sure you get the edges. And if necessary, use your finger to get the coating on there. Now, I like to keep one hand dry and one hand wet so I don't end up with, um, you know, you know what I'm talking about, the, the bread cakey. from fingers. Okay. And then we're going to go straight into the breadcrumbs. And we're going to do the same thing that we did in the flour. Kind of swish it around a little bit. And I'm going to pick this up and actually dust the end so I have a dry... Ish. Part to put it on. Okay. So it should be evenly coated on all sides. And you're going to hear a little bit of a sizzle. It shouldn't be a great boisterous sizzle because we want this to cook slow so we make sure that our chicken gets cooked all the way through. So now we're going to repeat the exact same procedure with the other chicken breast. And that serves to cook the chicken all the way through, but also to make sure that your cheese is melted and that your ham is warm. Right, and that your breading is not overly brown.
and you'll see Liam when you get on later and check your uh, feed I had mentioned to Miss Deb and also to uh, Cheryl and Pat that we're going to be out Texas way in we November. Will. We will be in Texas in November. So if you live in the San Antonio, Austin area and would like to visit with us, you will have that opportunity. Yeah, I have a uh, continuing medical education or medical conference to go to and Leanne is going to join me. So uh, literally just before we went on air, uh, I was booking all of that travel. Remember, it's just a repeat of the other breast. If you find that you um, have, like I do, where a lot of the pancos stuck to the first breast, you can always add a little bit of extra panko to the breadcrumbs to even it out. I'm just going to leave it the way it is. It's fine. Is that mine or yours? Yours is the one that's in there. Oh. I was going to say, because I, I don't, I'm not overly a fan of panko. I like the more traditional breadcrumb. But. I love the crunchiness that you get from panko. All right, so we're going to toss out those breadcrumbs because they are contaminated. We're going to toss out this flour because it's contaminated. We're going to wash our hands because they are contaminated. And we're going to reserve the uh, eggs. The eggs, and we're going to give them to the dogs. Contaminate the dogs with them. Yeah, because eggs and chicken are the same. We get salmonella from Ralph either way. And it's something that a dog's digestive system deals a little bit better with than ours Correct. does. Correct. I'm just going to set this behind me because they will appreciate that Cheryl, later. Cheryl, Cheryl will agree to that. Yes, our friend Cheryl who is watching today is actually a doctor of veterinary medicine. Take the time to stir your polenta again. And it should be in your pan, gently boiling. Not rapidly, just it should be a nice, gentle little boil. So as it's in there, you should notice that it is, the, the grains are starting to expand and they're starting to get very puffed up and you really should be able to start seeing, be seeing the texture of the polenta. Okay, so let's take a look. It's getting there. We're going to move them around a little bit because the outside edge of the pan doesn't get as warm as the inside over the center of the burner. So we want to make sure they're evenly golden brown all the way around. Why am I getting an error? Please don't do this today. Move your pan a little bit. There you go. Okay. So. Yeah. You know, that pan is... I know. I need a new one. It's but I can't big. find one that I love. So I keep um, dealing with the same one. And it's... Uh, it's old, so what happens to a pan when you ruin the inner core, which I have done with this, is um, it starts to warp a little bit. I'll so know. it becomes convex. Yeah, it doesn't stay perfectly flat. And I've had this pan for close to 20 years, and so I've really gotten my money's worth out of it, but I can't find one that I like as much as this one, so I keep using the warped pan. So that's that, you know, but what can you do? Let's take a look and see. Okay, still got some time to go. All right, so like I said, we're going to start doing this once a month because many of you have said that you really like learning from me, and I'm excited to hear that. I'm excited to hear you 
uh, ask me questions about, oh my God, this is driving me up the wall. I don't think it's the pan. I think it's the electrical outlet, but whatever. Because um, I normally don't have anything else plugged into that outlet when it's on. So let's see if I do it this way, if it'll be better. I don't think so. The seat. The seat? No. You guys, I'm actually going to have to move this to the stove. Or I'll move the polenta to the stove and keep the... Um, yeah, do that. Keep the... Uh, what do you call here? And I'll so move this shot a little bit. Oh, it's too late. I don't want to see that mess. They're looking at the flowers. Just, just look at the flowers, Lizzie. Just look at the flowers, Lizzie. Okay. So I don't know what's going on with this thing today, and it's always performed really well. Move for me. your olive oil. I'm going to. Hang on. Again, we're putting this on medium heat. I have no idea. Maybe I've got the vent blocked. I don't know. We're just going to need it right here. So, um, what I'd love for you guys to tell me is what you want to learn. Do you want to have um, occasional live chats on Facebook where I answer your cooking questions? I think the next uh, recipe that we do, I'm kind of thinking, uh, Nancy said she'd really like to learn some new appetizers. Okay, see that beautiful that is? That gorgeous golden brown? Look at that. It's gorgeous. Um, Nancy wants to do some appetizers, so I'm thinking I might teach you how to make a really simple baked brie and maybe some spanakopita. The other thing that I had in mind was teaching you guys how to do a spinach souffle, which is a great vegetarian recipe. And... It's not as complicated as you think it is. It's really not hard at all. It just involves a stand mixer and some egg whites. So I'm gonna go stir my polenta. And remember, it should be gently, gently bubbling. It should not be rapidly boiling. Let's look at chicken breast number two. I'm going to swap it around. Remember, the middle of the pan gets a little hotter than the outside. And this is seriously, it's not a great demo because there's a lot of waiting around time. Um, so when we get this out of the pan, I'm actually going to pop it in the oven while we finish the sauce to keep it warm. So if you're going to do like I do, and I recommend that you do, go put your oven on to um, 325 just to keep it warm, or 300, just to keep this warm while we finish the sauce. I'm going to go ahead and do that. And um, this is a lot of standing around time, you guys. I just really, it's, it's not a fantastic demo. It's, um, it but, takes time. But it's a great dish. It's a great dish. So like one of the things that my friend Labette said, and I've mentioned this before, is that she finds that she rushes at the stove. And sometimes you just can't rush. You just have to take your time and let the pan do the work. Sometimes you just have to slow everything down and let the, the water do its work of, of like when we did the risotto, you've got to let the broth do its job. When we're doing this polenta, you've got to let the water sink into the grit. I don't know, I'm sure almost all of you have seen my cousin Vinny. And he talks about physics being suspended on that one guy's stove because water gets into a grit. that It doesn't happen any faster. It takes time. So a lot of times when you're cooking, you've got to keep in mind that it's not a microwave. And I know that there are a couple of people that I know that if it can't be done in a slow cooker or in a microwave, they just don't take the time to do it. 
And that's fine. This is not one of those recipes. And nothing I have shown you thus far could be done in a microwave or in a crock pot. It just, you can't do it. I cook on the stove, the stove takes time, and that's just the way it is. All right, let's flip this bad boy over and see what it looks like. Oh, look at that, gorgeous golden brown. And you should be smelling the sage that was in the oil. You should be smelling your chicken cooking. For me, part of the joy of cooking is the multi-sensory thing, okay? When you put it in your mouth, you've got the taste. You put it up to your nose and it smells a certain way. When you put it in your mouth, you've got all these textures going on, which is why I use the two different kinds of breadcrumbs, because I like the crispiness of the plain and the crunchiness of the panko. Um, and like I said, this is not a traditional, at all traditional, presentation, but I loved it so much when I went to that restaurant that I just kind of had to have it again. And so this is literally the first time I ever made the attempt to make it. Lynn, Lynn wants to know when you do the souffle, can you do it with chocolate instead of spinach? <laughs> no, we're not doing dessert. Maybe one day we'll do dessert. We'll do chocolate mousse and creme brulee. Oh, this is looking so good, you guys. I hope yours, can you see that gorgeous golden brown color? I hope yours look as good as this. This one's a little darker because it didn't have as much banker. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. This is looking really, really good, you guys. And it smells fucking amazing. So, oh, by the way, if you're watching with children, I curse, sorry. Uh, I know one of my friends who is going to tune in with her daughter, and I'm apologizing because I've never made this, but it's definitely going to be some swearing about. No. So well, you, anybody who knows you knows yeah. that there's definitely going to be yeah. some swearing involved. So if you, um, while your, your chicken is cooking, you develop a couple of little very dark pieces, you kind of want to pull those out. You don't want burnt breadcrumbs in your sauce, and we're going to make the pan sauce right in there. Let's go stir our polenta again. I'm showing everybody the mess. Oh, why? Because it's our freaking kitchen. It I is a know. working kitchen. But I move everything over there so nobody will see it. Too late. Because if I wanted you to see all of my tools, I'd leave them all behind. I have a lot of kitchen tools. Yeah, she does. We had to build this kitchen in this configuration so that I had enough room for all of my cookware. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think they could see. We have the cabinets. They go all the way to the ceiling. So we have three rows of cabinets installed. We use the top row of cabinets rather than just having like tchotchkes that get greasy and you have to dust every six months. Uh, we use that space to actually store things that are for the holidays or special use items, large serving pieces. Yeah, so that's all up there. And look at how gorgeous this is looking, you guys. Can you see that? It's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. And now we're just going to wait. So this is your opportunity to ask me questions while we're waiting. Mix a cocktail. Okay. Do you want to open that bottle of rosé? I was going to wait uh, okay. for when everything was done, but if you want me to do it now, since we're waiting. Sure. I can, for people who don't know how to open sparkling wine, I can give them a quick tutorial. Well, I can do that. Okay. I've, already, I've actually already peeled the foil. Okay. So, so, uh, Leanne and I, I'm not a wine guy. Anybody who knows me knows I'm not much of a wine guy. I'm more of a beer drinker. Uh, but I have developed a taste for sparkling rosé. And in particular, I love the Spanish cava. So this is a 
what I refer to as a cheap ass Spanish cava, <laughs> which we actually did a cava tasting, a blind cava tasting one night with our dinner group. And this one turned out to be one of the favorites. And it is by Villa Conqui. And a cava uh, is a Spanish uh, sparkling wine. So, you know, champagne only comes from the champagne region, that blah, blah, blah. Lot. So, uh, a cava is uh, made in Spain. So what you do when you open up a sparkling wine, first thing, you're going to have a foil wrap on it. So look for the wire uh, ring and you can pick or sometimes it'll have a little zip and you take your foil wrap off. Once you've taken your foil wrap off, then what you want to do is untwist and remove your cage. Once your cage is off, now you have an unprotected cork. Now the downside to this is that that cork, if this has been shaken recently, or if it has gotten warm, right, is going to put a dent in your ceiling. So what you want to do is actually uh, cover gently with a towel. I use a towel too. I don't do. Yeah, I. You know what? I don't like using my using it by hand either. My hands are my money makers. So. Uh, and I gently twist back and forth while pulling slightly and you'll hear just a gentle pop. Yeah, the people who do this with the champagne and it goes rookie move, yeah. amateurs. That is, that is uh, somebody who knows nothing about champagne They don't know anything about wine, anything. They think but, they're cool but they're but not. But they want it to look cool. They want to impress their friends. So, and when you pour actually uh, keep the glasses flat. Do not lift the glass. And a great tip we got from John Anthony is you pour is, to the top. Is to put a little bit in the bottom so it doesn't foam up as much. But and if you do, do that, that. And wait, and then go back. John Anthony is the uh, front of the house manager at Sparrow and Wolf, one of our favorite restaurants here in town. Who we'll be seeing tomorrow. Yes, we'll be joining them for Father's Day. And it foamed up just as much. <laughs> I should have done it my way. So I like to, to pour it about halfway and it foams and then you can move on to the other glass and so that way the foam dissipates and then you go back. And look how so. pretty those bubbles are. Look at that. It's so, beautiful. Cheers. cheers. Anybody who's wondering, I buy this at uh, Total Wine and More here locally. And it runs about uh, $11.99 a bottle. Yeah, really inexpensive and it tastes great. And any of our friends who have enjoyed it at the house, feel free to chime in on the comments and tell everybody how delicious it is. All right, so I turned off my burner while we were talking, uh, but I want to turn it back on and I want to deglaze that pan with the white wine. So I'm going to bring that, um, Burner back up to like medium high. I'm gonna give our polenta a quick stir. So you should be noticing that your polenta is starting to uh, maybe stick a little bit to the bottom of the pan every now and then. That means you need to stir it more often because as it gets closer and closer to being done, the viscosity is gonna change and it's gonna wanna stick to the pan a little bit more. So get your pan good and hot, and we're gonna take our white wine, and again, I'm using Pinot Grigio. You know, don't cook with something that you're not willing to drink, okay? So again, I've said this before, I'm gonna say it again, do not use that Holland House bullshit from the grocery store. If you read the label, it's not just wine, it's wine and salt and some other shit. This is just straight up wine, okay? So when you add, it's gonna, we love that sound. So I'm putting like a half a cup in there and we're gonna swirl it around to get all the little bits off the bottom and then I'm gonna add a little bit more. I know I told you whatever I told you, but this is different. So, um, I'm using my tongs just to pick up everything. Now, for those of you who don't drink, I have said this before, I'm gonna say it again, all of the alcohol burns off. 
So, you know, my dad, he was a recovering alcoholic. I would feel very comfortable making this for him because I knew he wasn't going to get any alcohol in his food, okay? So all the alcohol is going to burn completely off and all you're going to be left with is that beautiful flavor and the um, wine itself, the, the liquid that's in it, is going to pull the starches from the leftover um, paper, uh, paper crumbs, breadcrumbs and stuff that are in there. It's going to kind of start to thicken up a little bit and that is a beautiful thing. And you're deglazing the pan, right? Correct. I'm deglazing the pan. Which I thought I said. Did I not say it? I don't think you said it. Okay. I didn't hear it. Okay. Let's stir our pots again. See, we'll Cheryl, I told you we were going to get to the wine. We're getting down to the wire on the polenta. Okay. So this is, I mean, I'm going to show you how much that wine cooked down. You saw how much I put in there. There's less than a quarter of a cup left. And we just want the flavor. So now we're gonna add in some lemon juice. You can do this one of a couple ways. I'm gonna use about the juice of a half a lemon. I'm gonna use a citrus press. If you don't have a citrus press, you wanna hold it flesh side up and squeeze in so that the seeds don't end up in your pan. Oh, I lost one. I'll have to pick it out. No, go on yours. I'll just pick it out. And a lot of this lemon juice is going to cook up too. Whoop. Mix it in with your wine. Okay. And turn your pan off. Okay. The last thing we're going to do right before we serve this is we're going to do a little technique called mont It's French. From hey, Mount, really? From Mount the Butter. And what it basically means is that we're going to take our butter, put it in the hot pan that is off the heat, and stir constantly to incorporate that butter as it melts into our sauce. So what it's going to do is it's going to give you a beautiful glossy color it's gonna give you a nice creamy texture. But if your pan is on the heat, it's gonna melt the butter, it's gonna be clear. It's not gonna have that creamy texture. And we want the creamy texture. So I've got a whole stick of unsalted butter here. Part of it's gonna go into our polenta, and part of it is gonna go into our sauce. So let's check on our polenta now. You're not a real cook if you're not tasting your damn food, okay? So, get a spoon out, and you're going to taste that polenta. Now, it's not going to taste like much yet, okay? Mine's not ready, because my corn is still crunchy, and there's still more liquid to be absorbed, okay? It's not ready. So, for those of you who know how to cook grits, Cook polenta exactly the way you cook grits. Whatever texture you like your grits at, cook polenta the same way. That's not ready. I'm gonna actually add a little more heat. And stir, 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 stir. It's almost there. All right, so let's talk about our Parmesan cheese. We're gonna use Parmesan cheese today as a garnish on our salt and boca, but we're gonna use it as a flavorant in our grits, in our polanti. John, you gotta move the camera back to me. And you're still in shot, don't worry about it. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so. Because now you would be out of shot again. It's okay. I gotta figure out what's going on. I think I was blocking the vent on that thing with the pan. And that's why I kept getting the error message because the vent's on the back. Okay, so our pan is hot. I'm gonna take this knife that I used to cut the cheese open with. I'm gonna put two tablespoons of butter into our still warm pan. And I'm just gonna use our tongs. You can use a whisk if you want. I'm just gonna 
run it around the pan and the heat from the pan is going to be enough. Okay? And it's going to be beautiful and glossy. This is like a, almost as boring a demo as the mushroom risotto because it just takes a lot of time. And maybe you should have started with the polenta. Well, it's a good thing I started drinking early and more entertaining. <laughs> so the, mm, the butter and the wine and the lemon, it should be smelling amazing in your kitchen right now. You've got that little bit of sage left over from the oil that was in the pan. Oh, man, that smells so good. Okay, so our sauce is done. Our chicken is done. The only thing we're waiting on is that damn polenta. So one of the things you need to know about cooking polenta or grits is depending on what part of the country you live in, depending on the breed of corn, depending on the manufacturer, how coarse it is, there's a lot of different variables on how long it actually takes to cook. Generally between 20 and 30 minutes, okay? Generally. Sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. I'm gonna get this sucker out. And my polenta should be just about ready. I'm gonna remove it from the heat. I'm gonna bring it over to you guys. I didn't tell you to have a, a trivet because I didn't think I was gonna need it. All right, so I thought I was gonna be working right on the burner. Okay, so here's our polenta. That rest, that stick of butter. <laughs> and stir it in. And once that is in, then you're gonna add your Parmesan cheese. Now, Parmesan cheese has a lot of salt. And you do this to taste. Nancy asked me, how much parm do I need? Na do it to taste. And Nancy also said her sauce is oily looking. That her pan was too hot when she put the butter in. That's what it means. It's okay. It'll taste the same. It'll taste just as delicious. It's just not going to be the same look that mine has. But let's taste our grits, our polenta. Mine have plenty of cheese, but it needs a little bit more salt. And it needs a little grind of fresh black pepper. Traditional accompaniment for um, salt and boca is a sauteed spinach. Um, I taught you guys how to make cream spinach when we did the crepes thing. You could definitely serve that with this. I need my dry towel. is plate it. So, using my tongs, Nancy wants to know if there's anything that she can add to make it less oily looking. Wait for it to cool down and add another uh, pat of butter. I see mine is separating a little bit because I let it sit for too long and it's fine. It'll still taste great. Yeah, she said that uh, what can, you know, the sauce is oily looking. So now what Walt says he won't eat it. So my reply was actually let him go hungry. 
You know, he it's can just he can order better. he can he can order takeout pizza and you can enjoy the salt and mocha. So and it's just butter. Damn it, Walt. Okay, so we're just gonna put a couple of tablespoons of sauce right on top. I'm gonna put extra sauce on this one because John is a saucy guy and likes extra sauce. And then we're gonna take our sage leaf, which should be crispy and beautiful, and pop that right on top. And I didn't pull a ladle or serving spoon for the grip. I'm taking the wine. Why? Okay, and there you have it. That's all there is to it. You guys can totally do this. Get my other chicken breast. I'm zooming in on the plate. Go for it, because it's beautiful. I mean, come on, how pretty is that? How damn pretty is that plate? And that is one of my favorite Italian dishes. And whether you do it with veal or chicken or pork. It's it, delicious. It, exactly. It always comes out I'm giving you tasting extra fabulous. Sauce well, yeah, you like thank that. you. You love this. Here's mine with my beautiful sage leaf on top. Boop. Oh, and you took the forks over there. I wanted to have one so I could cut into it in front of everybody and show them what mine looked like. So here, thanks. Look at how beautiful that is. Have you ever seen a prettier dish? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this one out of the way into the table, and then that way you can put that one out front so they can see. So when you cut into it, you're going to see the layers of your chicken and your ham. And I'm cheese. zooming in. It's falling. You got it? Yeah. <laughs> and of course it fell. So let's taste it and see how we did. And I got this thing to flip around. There we go. We briefly had a close-up mm. of my pinky and the burning t-shirt. Mm -mm 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 -mm. You guys, it is so good. The only thing I could have done differently is pounded out the chicken breast a little bit thinner. Other than that, the flavor is incredible. You got the saltiness from the um, prosciutto. You get the great crunch from the breadcrumb crusting. You got the wine, the butter, the sage, the lemon, all working in that sauce. It is absolutely incredible. So I'm hoping. Yours came out as good as mine. I'm hoping that you enjoy this demo. As soon as we decide what we're gonna make, of course I will post it, I will set up the event, I will invite you. Listen, there's a couple things I'd love for, to ask for you guys. Share my blog with your friends. Share my Facebook page with your friends. Invite your friends to join my page. And that way they can cook along with you and you guys can have your own little cooking club at home. Also, comment, comment, comment. I love it when you show me your food. I love it when you tell me what your challenges were. If I didn't explain something well enough, let me know that so that I could do a better job next time. So enjoy, eat. Goodbye from Quarantine Kitchen. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there and to all the moms who are doing double duty as both parents in a single parent household. So. Love you all. Thanks for watching. Enjoy your salt and boca.